Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And on your screen right now is a blast from the past. It's the thumbnail to episode one of Virtual Legality. Just look at that logo. Look at that thumbnail. But the reason I bring it up here today is because episode one continues to represent one of the most common questions that I receive for this show and on this channel. And that is basically... Hey, can I get a refund for that? In the case of Fallout 76, we looked at the terms of service. We looked at the conditions that the game was sold in. And we came to the conclusion that it was unlikely that a false advertising or other refund campaign would likely win the day in respect of that particular video game. But there have been instances where advertising has appeared, if not false, at least a little bit misrepresentative. We talked about it earlier this year with respect to the sales of Horizon Forbidden West. And people call me out as being against PlayStation on things like this, but all I'm really against is false messaging or at least misleading messaging. And I love Horizon Forbidden West. It's one of my games of the year, but Sony sold a copy on the PlayStation 5 that was $10 more than the PlayStation 4 while simultaneously selling that PlayStation 4 copy with a free upgrade to the PlayStation 5 copy. So unless you had very specific needs for what you wanted to purchase physically, it was at least misleading to not inform you of the fact that you could get the game for $10 less through a series of buttons that they weren't otherwise highlighting for you. So we have all of these instances in this space where we talk about false advertising, misleading statements, potentially problematic messaging, and I very often come up with the answer, chances are you couldn't win a lawsuit on that because it's just not obvious enough. Well, today we might well have our first instance of a pretty obvious case of false advertising brought to us by the fine folks at Reddit. But let's talk about that in just a second. Before we get into details, I do want to remind people, if you like discussions about the business and law of video games, software, technology, and more, please consider supporting the channel through our Utreon or our Patreon membership on YouTube or just likes and subscribes because we can't do it without folks like you. Now, as I promised, we do have a Reddit contribution, which I always recommend taking with a grain of salt. It's anonymously posted, but there's a lot of proof that goes into this one and a lot of things that I could otherwise corroborate for myself. And this is an image brought by the Reddit poster who goes by the name of Unfallener, who put up a thread within the last day that was entitled, Avoid the Physical PS4 Copy of a Game Called Vampire the Masquerade Swan Song. If you're wanting that free PS5 upgrade, Nacon, the publisher, got back to me today and admitted to false advertising. Not quite in so many words, but also yes. If we go back to the image that was provided by this Reddit user, you can see right here on the bottom reference to a quote-unquote PS5 upgrade available. Now, honestly, as a lawyer, I would have to say that that doesn't end the story because upgrade available isn't technically a promise that it will be made available to you at any given price or that it will be easy to get or anything like that. I would still probably call it out if they made it difficult on these particular axes, but it doesn't commit to it being free on the front of the box. Enter the back of the box. And there we see the footnote leads to the following statement, upgrade to the digital PS5 version of the game at no additional cost. Ooh, that's a promise. To upgrade eligible PS4 disc copies, players need a PS5 console, makes sense, with a disc drive, playstation.com slash help. This is the standard boilerplate language that a publisher puts on their box when they have one of these free upgrade pathways. And as you could probably tell already from the Reddit thread, Nikon is not honoring that pathway. In fact, they got an email back to this individual, which we have to take with a grain of salt because it is anonymously sourced, but certainly seems legitimate, that reads the following. Thank you for contacting us. First... We would like to apologize for not responding quicker to your email. Always nice, customer service. We inform you that the developers confirm that if you bought the version of the video game for PS4, it is not possible to update the video game for the PS5 version. Unfortunately, Swansong is not a cross-gen product. If it's mentioned on the box, it's a mistake. That's fair enough. Human beings make mistakes, but that doesn't end the legal inquiry. We remain at your disposal for any further information. Best regards from the signatory from what is support at nacongaming.com. Now, again, I said I did corroborate some of this myself. I could go and I could look at storefronts like here at JNL Game and see that the box for this particular product, Vampire the Masquerade Swan Song, does in fact have these kind of notations on the box art that they have. But 
that doesn't actually end our inquiry because although we can see it on this box, although we can see it on places on eBay where you can go and look and on the back of the box on places like eBay, it doesn't actually appear in every instance of the box art that we can find. If you go to the Best Buy box art, for instance, it has no notation that this game is made available for a free PS5 upgrade. Similarly, Amazon doesn't have that notation as well. Now, we also have to take this with a grain of salt. Even as clear as this might seem, this doesn't appear to be an actual box that's had a picture taken of it. It appears to be a rendering of that box. So we don't really know what this looks like out in the wild so much, except that there are definitely copies of it out in the wild that make this promise. So bare minimum, while we might not be looking at an intentional deception on the market, particularly if these folks at Nacon got that message off the box eventually, they still have to concern themselves with the fact that there are versions that appear to make a promise that say you buy this on the PlayStation 4, you're gonna get one of these free upgrades. And the reasonable consumer knows that these pathways are out there for free, especially if they're paying attention to some of the games that publishers are playing on this question. So it becomes a point of contention. If you bought one of those, you found yourself at a GameStop or a Best Buy or otherwise, you pick up one of those copies. It has the notation that we're concerned about on it. What, if anything, can you do when Nacon comes back to you and says, our bad, bro, was a mistake? Well, chances are you might have a realistic complaint for maybe the first time in this space. Not really. Uh, but we often say, hmm, not a great case. This one, probably a pretty darn good case. And why? Let's talk about fraud. Now, we're going to start out here with a blog post from an attorney here. Lots of attorneys go out there with blog posts like this. A lot of good information you can get. We take it with a grain of salt. We are not otherwise doing this analysis, but it seemed good, seemed solid from what I looked at, matched up with my own understanding of the situation. And we're going to talk about common law fraud, which is the way that we describe fraud when we don't look at a specific jurisdiction statute. So if you can believe it, if you go to law school right now, in the United States, primarily you're going to be taught common law treatise level principles because any given law school can't teach you what a given jurisdiction is going to have in its statute. So if you're in New York, if you're in California, if you're in Michigan, Texas, Florida, wherever you might find yourself, this might vary a little bit, but the precepts will remain the same. So what do you need to prove this amorphous concept that we call fraud, that we all intuitively understand is cheating in some respect, but that the law has trouble with, or as this particular article says, fraud cannot be easily defined because it can be accomplished in so many different ways, which leads us to the nine elements of common law fraud here. That's a lot of elements. Generally speaking, we like to keep this to two, three elements. It's easier to understand, but we can go through this and talk about what it means. In the United States, common law generally identifies nine elements needed to establish fraud. One, a representation of a fact. Two, it's falsity. That fact is false. Three, it's materiality. It's important to the purchasing decision in this particular case. Four, the representer's knowledge of its falsity or ignorance of its truth, right? If you're going to go out there, it's important when we're talking about fraud, that's a kind of intentional act that the people that are putting that information out there know that it's false. Five, the representer's intent that it should be acted upon by the person in the manner reasonably contemplated. They want to sell you that copy of that game. Six, the injured party's ignorance of its falsity. Seven, the injured party's reliance on its truth. Eight, the injured party's right to rely thereon. And nine, the injured party's consequent and proximate injury. Now that's very fancy lawyer talk of things that we can break down in this particular instance pretty clearly. Is there a representation of a fact? Absolutely. The PS5 upgrade is available. The PS5 upgrade is free. Those are two representations of facts that we are now told, at least if we're taking this on faith, that Nacon says, oh, those are wrong, are bad. If it's mentioned on the box, it's a mistake. Sorry about that. So we have a representation of a fact. We also have acknowledgement of its falsity. It's a mistake. Okay, element one, element two, down. It's materiality. Is it important? Is it significant? Well, I dare say it is. Now, this is in essence, in this kind of context, when you're putting things and promises on the box, kind of assumed, right? Why is a publisher going to put things on the box? It is in an effort to get you to purchase that good, which means that at least from their perspective, they think it is material. Now, if you came into court and said, actually, I didn't even see that there, you're going to lose on a fraud case, right? Oh, no, that didn't drive my purchasing decision at all. By the time you are making a Reddit post talking about the fact that you have talked to them since August and through October because you wanted to get this upgrade that you thought you could get, you've 
basically shown that it was in fact material to you, which is going to dovetail with some of the other elements as we will see. Four, the representator's knowledge of its falsity or ignorance of its truth. This gets a little tricky here, right? So this gets tricky only in so far as Nacon describes it as a mistake and they are a publisher of a developer's video game and maybe didn't know that this wasn't in fact true. Now, if you can actually show behind the scenes that this got confused somehow and emails was never supposed to appear on the box, maybe you can defeat this kind of thing. But ultimately, the, the assumptions are probably going to roll against you if you're Nacon or a publisher because it's assumed if you put it on the box, that took extra effort. You needed to space it. You needed to make sure it appeared in these various ways. You needed to check out all the ways in which this box could be constructed, and you are the closest in point of reference to knowing whether or not this is true, right? If the law has to decide between random purchaser at GameStop, Reddit poster, and you, Nacon, it should assume against you because you're the one that can know better than the person that is otherwise put out for this purchase that they might have made based on the promises that appear on this box. So that's a trickier one. That's one of the elements that is maybe a little bit softer, but probably doesn't get Nacon out of jail on this because of that ignorance of truth kind of component. You you are in a position to know, you should know, we're not going to place the onus, the liability, the exposure risk on the purchaser for what you should rightly know. Element five, the representer's intent that it should be acted upon by the person in the manner reasonably contemplated, that's what dovetails with the materiality concept, right? Why do you put it on the box unless you think it's going to sell copies to somebody, right? This doesn't appear on the box if you think it's of no use whatsoever. And so if you put it on the box, we can assume that you, Mr. Publisher, think that it's going to drive some purchase on the margins. And that's enough to meet that element. Number six, the injured party's ignorance of its falsity. Certainly as represented here, the purchaser of the game didn't know that it was false when they purchased it, didn't have an understanding that this wasn't true. Now, after this video goes up, right, if this gets covered in more and more places, it might prove more difficult for the next purchaser of a product like this, or even a reader of this Reddit post to be able to claim that they didn't know it was false because they've looked at this email, they've listened to me talk about it, maybe they've read a separate article on it. You're not individually going to be able to say, aha, I got them. I'm going to go buy this game. I'm going to get a refund. I'm going to keep the game and everybody wins. The law doesn't like to do that. The law likes to balance the stakes. So one of the elements is, okay, if you already know it's false, you can't game the system on this. But there's no reason to believe that the Reddit poster or potentially earlier purchasers knew it was false at the time. Now, the injured party's reliance on its truth, right? I did buy the game in part because of this promise made to me. This kind of goes with the knowledge of things here. If I didn't even see it, that's going to be a tough case to bring. If, as in point of fact is happening in this case, you bring that Reddit thread and say, I've got a problem you almost certainly relied on its truth. And you can evidence that by two months of working to try to get that particular digital copy to you. Number eight, the injured party's right to rely thereon. Yes, we have a generalized right to believe in the advertisements and the promises that are made to us on at least a common law contract basis. You're promising this to me. I'm exchanging money for those goods. That's a kind of consideration. That's a kind of contract. And if you lied about one of those promises, well then, I can rely upon it. And then nine, the injured party's consequent and proximate injury. This is very easy. This is money that I spent. I lost money out of my pocket to get this product that was deceitfully advertised to me. And so you have, in basic form, the nine elements of common law fraud, should you choose to pursue it, at least if you're at the level of this Reddit poster. People that come in after the fact, people that can't otherwise attest to actually even seeing that promise or otherwise buying this product because of that promise, they're not going to have the same kind of ability to bring this case. But therein lies some of the regulatory agencies. We're not just stuck suing over these things directly. Indeed, the Federal Trade Commission has been given by the legislature and the executive branch of the U.S. government ambit over protecting consumers in general on truth in advertising as a basis. Or as the Federal Trade Commission puts here, when the Federal Trade Commission finds a case of fraud perpetuated on consumers, the agency files actions in federal district court for immediate and permanent orders to stop scams. And the FTC enforces these truth in advertising laws and it applies the same standards no matter where the ad appears. In fact, if we go and look at the FTC Act here, we find the following. Unfair methods of competition in or affecting commerce and unfair or deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce are hereby declared 
unlawful. The commission is hereby empowered and directed to prevent persons, partnerships, or corporations from using unfair methods of competition in or affecting commerce and unfair or deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce. Now you see all those references from a lawyer's perspective of in or affecting commerce. That's what we call a constitutional hook. If you remember the U.S. Constitution, Congress is only allowed to make laws that affect commerce, particularly interstate commerce. Uh, and so a lot of these statutes that otherwise empower a federal agency mandate that that jurisdiction for their power only extends to things like here that affect commerce. But that's not going to prevent any problems here because this game got made, it got shipped, it got moved. There's internet advertisement. All of this stuff associates with this game. It is undoubtedly under the ambit of the FTC's powers. So we can take a look at what those FTC powers are, right? Because if we look at the act itself, what does deceptive mean? What does unfair mean? Well, the FTC has the power to determine those things for itself, but we could use a little bit more clarity. And you will find that it dovetails nicely with the concept of fraud we just went over. So the FTC says as follows, and I always love these uh, frequently asked questions for small businesses from all of these regulatory agencies. If you're ever looking to do research on your own, they're often very useful because they try to bring things down to a small business person's level and they can be a very useful guide to some complicated statutory materials. Under the Federal Trade Commission Act, Advertising must be truthful and non-deceptive. Advertisers must have evidence to back up their claims and advertisements cannot be unfair. Now we're going to be focusing on deceptive here because backing up their claims is more like this tonic can cure the common cold, et cetera, et cetera. What makes an advertisement deceptive? Well, according to the FTC's deception policy statement from 1983, folks, an ad is deceptive if it contains a statement or omits information that is likely to mislead consumers acting reasonably under the circumstances and is material. That is important to a consumer's decision to buy or use the product. Again, even without the nine elements of common law fraud, just looking at that description, it seems clear to me that the FTC would have control over this particular situation. There is a promise made that an upgrade is available, that that upgrade is made for free. It is in its constitution on the box of the product indicative of the fact that they want it to be deemed material. We have ancillary evidence from the existence of the Reddit thread itself that it is material and that this person and other people in a like situated circumstance purchased this game, this version of the product based on the promise that they could upgrade it for free at a later time. That is, it is important to a consumer's decision to buy or use the product. Now, in terms of unfairness, we don't need to worry about that as much. That's about claims and whether or not they could cause injuries or otherwise provide benefits to consumers. Uh, how does the FTC determine that deception concept? They look at things from a reasonable consumer point of view. Uh, the typical person looking at the ad, in other words, the person standing at the store. And it's not generally the case that what is described to you is every possible internet article ever made. You don't have to be deemed to have watched this virtual legality episode once it is uploaded if you're otherwise standing there. But if you did happen to do so, your personal case might otherwise be a problem. Rather than focusing on certain words, the FTC looks at the ad in context, words, phrases, pictures to determine what it conveys to consumers. Here you have actual sentences, so this doesn't come up as much. The FTC looks at what the ad does not say as well. That is, if the failure to include information leaves consumers with a misimpression about the product. For example, if a company advertised a collection of books, the ad would be deceptive if it did not disclose that the consumer would actually be receiving abridged versions of those books. So let's pretend, let's play a thought experiment here. If this were the only thing that we were talking about, just this front page, as I said, legally, it's probably technically correct that a PS5 upgrade is available, even if it isn't made available easily, even if it isn't made available for free, but the FTC could still even come in here if you have a NACON email that says, no, we're not going to offer it at all and say, uh, that's deceptive at minimum, right? It should be clear that you put this on the very front of your box, one of the few pieces of advertising copy on the front of that box that gets you to a place where somebody's buying that game for that promise and oh, well, yes, it's available, but not really for you. That's not going to hold water with the FTC. Then, as we discussed above, they're going to look at whether it's material. Examples of material claims are representations about a product's performance, features, ding, 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 safety, price, or effectiveness. So here, we just have a broad-ranging, effectively, lie about what is offered. Nankai wants to say it's a mistake. We can give him the benefit of the doubt. We can say it's a mistake. If it is a mistake, the law then looks at the situation and says, all right, well then, who should have the liability for that mistake? And it shouldn't be Consumer Joe who went and bought a game based on the promises that you provided to him, it should be you. 
What are we really worried about at the FTC? Among other things, we're worried about claims that consumers can't evaluate for themselves. There is no way to be aware of whether or not this is actually provided to you other than the front of the box at the point in time where you're making the purchase. Yes, at this point, when this video goes up, when other articles maybe go up about this particular topic, you will have perhaps a greater obligation to go and check that, look it up on your phone, whatever it might be. But in general, the FTC is going to look at this and say, there's no way to know that this isn't available when the box says that it is. And so we're going to look at that even in more particularity than other circumstances might afford. Now, what can the FTC do? A couple of things, some of which make some sense, some of which make a little bit more sense. One, they can go take it to court. We talked about the powers that they have under the FTC Act, and the court can then order refunds if it came to it. That's the FTC bringing the case, not necessarily an individual case. The other thing that they can do, and this is the usual course of business for people selling products in this kind of environment, they can correct the advertising, right? You might say, Rick, there's boxes already out there. What does that take? What does it cost? And I will tell you, back in the day, way back in the day, I worked at a game company called Electronics Boutique, retail store in the mall near me. And one of the things that we would very consistently get are stickers, right? What are those stickers for? It's not just for fun. It's not just for having a good time putting board games together. It is in fact stickers that replaced certain things on the back of boxes that we were selling products for. These include changing the PC specs uh, for a game that we were selling on the shelves or removing a feature that was otherwise referenced on the box because the lawyers looked at it and said, oh my God, that's not actually what we're delivering. Here's a set of stickers. And they would tell GameStop management, which would ultimately filter down to me, the low level peon working at the store to put these stickers on a particular fashion to try to get out in front of this. This is one of the reasons why you might've seen a couple of days ago, an article by Kotaku that said Diablo three couldn't remove its real money auction house because the lawyers said they were worried about promises that were made about that to which I tweeted out, mm, I'm not sure I believe you because these kind of remedial actions to correct problems with a product are taken all the time. So perhaps Nacon got in front of this, perhaps the version that actually made its way out to stores, which is very difficult to tell whether it's rendered or not in these particular circumstances online, perhaps it doesn't include these promises, but at least for those copies that definitely do, Nacon's got a problem. You legitimately are looking at a false advertisement case here. I think the most likely avenue for correction is some kind of refund or maybe even the price of a digital download or a digital download code that was promised to you in the box. But right this second, this is one of the clearest cases that I have seen in this space, suggestive of the fact that if you've got one of these boxes and you bought it and you didn't know that this wasn't in fact true, that maybe you can bring a claim against Nacon and anyone else involved in this particular advertising process. Again, if you like the business and law conversations we have here in Virtual Legality, please consider supporting the channel at Utreon or Patreon, or if none of those appeal to you, just subscribing, telling your friends, ringing bells, engaging with the content. YouTube absolutely loves it when you hit buttons on its service. If you could do that, I would very much appreciate it. If you did catch this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it instead as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.